In this video, I'm going to demonstrate how to calculate the optimal portfolio of risky assets using Excel, and then also using Excel, calculate the proportion of an individual investor's portfolio that should be invested in the risky asset portfolio and the risk-free asset. So uh, we're going to do this using the Markowitz portfolio optimization model. Uh, within that model, uh, there's a minimum variance frontier, and that's the lowest possible variance that can be attained for any given level of expected return. The global minimum variance portfolio is the portfolio of risky assets that has the lowest variance of all risky asset portfolios. And finally, the efficient frontier is the range of all investments that are within the minimum variance frontier and are above or higher have a higher return than the global minimum variance portfolio. What you should consider is that we're going to look for the optimal portfolio, which gives us the best risk return trade-off, and that would lie along this minimum variance frontier um, within a set of a given uh, risky asset. In this video, I'm going to look at four different stocks, and we're going to combine those in the best weights to give us that, bit, uh, that risk return trade-off that is the optimal outcome. So, the expected return for a portfolio is calculated as the weights of the assets within the portfolio multiplied by their expected returns. The variance of a two-asset portfolio and the two risky assets, in this case are X and Y, so think of those as two different stocks, is calculated as the weight of X squared multiplied by the variance of X plus the weight of y squared multiplied by the variance of y plus two times the weight of x multiplied by the weight of y multiplied by the covariance of x and y or how they move together. So if we generalize this out to more than two assets, we come up with the following equation, which is the sum of the sum of the weights multiplied together for each asset i and j and so what we have here is if, if we have just x, so it would be the weight of x multiplied by the weight of x, so it gives us x squared, multiplied by the variance of x, which is the covariance of, a, of an asset, a single asset is its variance. Okay, so this is the generalized equation for this specific equation when we take it to more than two assets. After we move past a two-asset portfolio, it's necessary to use matrix multiplication to determine the optimal asset weights in the portfolio. So using uh, matrix multiplication notation, this is what our equation would look like. Uh, we have the weights of the portfolio, of the assets of the portfolio transposed, multiplied by their expected returns. And you can see this in the document that accompanies this video. In Excel, the formula is going to look like this equals MMult, so that stands for matrix multiplication. Transpose, so we're going to transpose the column of weights multiplied by the, the uh, column of expected returns. When making calculations with arrays in Excel, type in the formula, but don't press Enter. Instead, hold down Shift and Control, and holding those down, press Enter. This tells Excel that you're making a calculation with an array, otherwise you're going to get an error and then puts the cur curly parentheses around the formula. You'll see that in the uh, equation bar in Excel. The variance of the portfolio is calculated as the weights of each asset in the portfolio transposed multiplied by S. S is the variance covariance matrix, and I'll demonstrate how to calculate the variance covariance matrix in Excel, and then multiply it again by the weights of the assets in the portfolio. The standard deviation of the portfolio is calculated as the square root of the variance of the portfolio, and in matrix notation looks like this. S is the variance covariance matrix, as I mentioned before, and our equation looks like this. Equals square root mmult mmult. Okay, so we have two products here, so that's where we're using two mmults, and then we transpose the weight, so we do that there. So we're making this multiplication, and then we're making this multiplication, and then again we press Control shift hold those down, press Enter to get the calculation for the portfolio variance. 
So the optimal weights for assets in a portfolio are the ones that maximize the value of the Sharpe ratio for the portfolio. The Sharpe ratio for the portfolio is the expected return for the portfolio minus the risk-free rate divided by the standard deviation of the portfolio. And I'll demonstrate how to use Solver in Excel to do this. Finally, we want to say, okay, we've got this optimal portfolio of risky assets. Now we want to look at the individual investor and based on their level of risk aversion, how much of their wealth should they put in that risky portfolio and how much should they set aside and put in a risk-free asset? To do that, we're going to use this equation, which says that the proportion of the portfolio invested in the risky portfolio y asterisk is equal to the expected return for the portfolio minus the risk-free rate divided by A, so A is a measure of the investor's risk aversion, multiplied by the variance of the portfolio. All right, so now we're going to open up Excel. We're going to start with just a, a list of prices, and you can see, and it's important to note this, that they're in descending order based on date, so we're going to use that to calculate the returns for a five-year period for each of these stocks. So today we're looking at Bank of America, AT&T, Star Energy, and Union Pacific. We'll calculate the returns for the portfolio, the standard deviation of the portfolio, both for an equally weighted portfolio, and then we're going to calculate that optimal risky portfolio. Here I'll show you how to calculate the variance covariance matrix and also the portfolio returns. So let's go ahead and get started. Because we have our, our prices in descending order based on time, uh, we want to calculate our holding period return as follows. So we're going to take the most recent price uh, minus the, the last month's price divided by the previous month's price to get our return. If your dates are in ascending order over time, you're going to change that to reflect, you're going to change your calculation to reflect that. I'm just going to pull that across. Pull that down. I'm going to double check that I did it right here. So B3, the most recent price, minus last month's price, the previous month's price, divided by the previous month's price would give me a, a uh, two point, negative 2.38% return. I did not include the last row here because if I do that, I'll show you what happens. There's no previous month's prices from which to calculate the return, we get error messages, so we're just going to take that out. So to calculate the average monthly return, I'm going to press equals, type in average, I'm going to highlight the returns for Bank of America, and press enter. The monthly variance then, I can do the same thing, equals, the variance, VAR, and there's different options within Excel. Uh, you can use the po uh, population variance, you can use the uh, sample variance. In the end, it doesn't have much of an effect on our outcome, and when we make the covariance covariance matrix, uh, we're going to use uh, just the COVAR command, covariance command in Excel, and it calculates the variance for each stock when we use a covariance of that stock. The average annual mean, in this case, is going to be equal to the monthly return times 12. And the annual variance, again, is going to be the monthly variance multiplied by 12. So we can see here for these four investments that we have a pretty wide range of outcomes. So Bank of America has the lowest return and the highest annual variance. So we'll see if mixing Bank of America with other assets gives us an outcome where we actually may want to buy Bank of America stock. But based on these, this outcome, it's not the preferred investment within this selection of stocks. AT&T, 10.44% uh, annual return over the period. Annual variance is 1.8%. Western Energy, higher return, but higher variance. And Union Pacific is somewhere in the middle. It's, the uh, return is between AT&T and Westar, but it has the highest variance or the highest volatility of all of the different stocks. So I'm going to do two things now. Uh, now that I've calculated that, 
I'm going to name these rows. Uh, so in that, that's going to make calculating our variance covariance ma matrix a lot easier. So I'm going to name this first row of returns. Note I did not include the name of the, the stock. BAC uh, returns up here in the name box. Uh, so now I can reference that column by just putting in BACRET. For AT&T, again, I'm going to do the same thing. And what I'm doing here is I'm holding down the control and the shift key and using the down arrow to highlight that column of stocks. So I'm going to put an AT&T return up here in the name box. And that's going to name that column of returns. Here I'm going to put West Star return, RET. And then finally, Union Pacific. Union Pacific sticker is UNP. So I'm going to put in UNP, RET to name those returns as well. And you'll see whenever I start typing in the, the array's name that it'll come up on its own here in Excel. So the next thing I'm going to do is uh, put the returns in here in this column. I'm going to press equal. And I'm going to point it to the annual return for... Uh, Bank of America down here. And I do this because if we change any of these numbers, then it will also change the numbers up here. For AT&T, that. For Westar Energy, put it down uh, there right here. And then for, finally for Union Pacific, we have the annual average return of 13.99%. So we have our column of returns for our assets in here. The next step, and it's kind of a long step, and that's why I uh, kept it to four stocks here. We're going to calculate the variance covariance matrix just to be consistent. I'm going to use a consistent, I'm going to use a single equation for each one, just changing the, the returns. It makes it a little easier too. So I'm going to put in equals covar. Uh, the array is going to be BAC return because I have. Bank of America here, and it's also going to be BACRET here, and that would give me my monthly covariance. But what I want to do is annualize that, so I'm going to multiply it by 12. For AT&T and Bank of America, our covariance going to, is going to look like this. You can see that it has a negative covariance, so they don't really move together very much. And then West Star Energy and Bank of America. Oops, sorry. Covar. PC return. And you might notice that as I type these in, this is blue, this is red, and it's showing you what it's highlighting as I do this as well. Then finally, Bank of America and Union Pacific. The variance covariance matrix is symmetrical, so I don't have to type that in for this first column because it's going to be the same numbers. So Bank of America and Westar has the same covariance as it will in the in the row up here. Same thing for uh, Union Pacific and Westar, or excuse me, Bank of America. So that looks good. Uh, I'm going to go with AT&T now equals the covariance of AT&T return. AT&T return multiplied by 12. Again, this just gives me the variance of AT&T. Then again, I can, because of the symmetrical nature of the, the matrix, I can just set those two equal to the, the other two. Now I'm going to calculate the, the variance of Westar. Uh, 
oftentimes what I see when I grade these and I actually do these, calculate these matrices, it is the lack of putting in the multiplication by 12. If you don't want to do that, you can get the same answer by calculating the monthly variance of the portfolio and then multiplying it by 12. And then finally, we have the variance of Union Pacific. All right. And so that finishes the variance covariance matrix. Uh, I've given you the risk-free rate, just set it at 3%. And, and I'll change this at the end to show you what happens uh, with the uh, weight in the risky portfolio for our investor. And also, the level of risk aversion I, I given that a 10 again I'm going to show you what happens when we change that level of risk aversion later on so for an equally weighted portfolio with four stocks the weights are going to be 25 percent in each stock so we always want to make sure that our weights sum to one because if they're not equal to one then we don't have the right weights in there our expected return is calculated as equals mmult transpose the weights so I've transposed the weights into a from a column to a row I'm going to close parentheses comma the returns close parentheses then I'm holding down control and shift and I press enter and our expected return for an equally weighted portfolio of these stocks based on their historic returns is 12.5%. The standard deviation is a little bit more ca complicated. So if you go back to that document, it says here that our standard deviation is going to look like this equal square root mmult mmult transpose the weights multiplied by the variance covariance matrix multiplied by the weights. So here I'm going to put in equals square root, oops, let me spell that right, there we go, square root, mmult, mmult, transpose, the weights. Now, oftentimes the mistakes I see in this place is that people want to include those returns in there, don't include the returns. Those are actually included here in the variance covariance matrix. So we've transposed those weights we're going to multiply it now by the variance covariance matrix close parentheses another comma multiply it by the non-transpose weights now put an extra put in an additional uh, close parentheses there now i'm going to hold control and shift and press enter we get a standard deviation of 12.51 percent so the question is can we do better so here's what we're going to do. We're going to start with those weights at 25% again. I'm going to type in equal sum, highlight those, and then I'm, I'm going to put in the same calculations. The expected return is equal to uh, mmult transpose the weights, but I'm going to use these weights down here close parentheses, comma, the returns up here, close parentheses, and then hold down again, control shift and press enter, 12.5%, it matches, so I'm happy. My standard deviation is equal to square root, mmult, mmult, transpose. So our weights again are down here, close parentheses, comma, our variance covariance matrix, close parentheses, comma, and our weights once more, close parentheses, close parentheses again, hold the, down the control shift and press enter, and we get the same answer. Again, I'm happy because it looks like I've done everything correct here. Our sharp ratio then is calculated as equals, we're going to put open parentheses here because we want to contain the numerator uh, while that's not in our 
calculation here. We want to contain the numerator. We don't want to put in the expected return minus the risk free, free rate divided by the standard deviation of the portfolio without that parentheses because it's just going to divide the risk free rate by the standard deviation. You're going to get a bizarre answer there. So we're using open parentheses. Use our expected return minus the risk free rate, which we have up here. Close parentheses divided by the standard deviation of the portfolio. Now our optimal weights will reflect the highest sharp ratio we can get because that gives us the best risk return trade-off. We get the highest level of return for a given level of risk or the lowest level of risk for the highest level of return. So to do this, I'm going to use solver. So go to data and you should have solver up here, but if you don't, go to file and options. Should open this up. You want to go to add-ins. So down below it says Excel add-ins, press go, and, and click the solver add-in if it's not checked yet. Press OK, and then solver should show up. So just to show you that briefly, go to File, Options, Add-ins, Excel add-ins, and then check solver. You'll be good to go there. So new solver, I'm going to clear everything out. Reset all. That's just a good practice to do. If you've used Solver in your workbook before, it's going to have what the last thing you did was, and that might mess everything up. So I just clear it all out. We want to maximize the sharp ratio. So our objective is to maximize this cell, the sharp ratio. So I'm going to select that. In this case, it's M3333. And the variables we want to change are the weights. So I'm going to select the, the four weights. And those weights are going to be subject to the constraint that the sum of those weights have to be equal to 1. And press OK there. The next point is important. There's a box here that says make unconstrained variables non-negative. So our weights here are our are, are unconstrained variables. And now if we allowed them to be negative, we're allowing short selling. And there's a lot of restrictions on short selling and the, what you can do with the funds from short selling. So we don't, we don't want to have short selling in our portfolio. So ch make sure that box is checked. So in, in that case, the minimum weight would be zero. So it would be non-negative. I'm going to select solve and we've got a solution. We can see here that we got a better outcome. So our sharp ratio went from 0 0.75, 0 0.76 to 1.02, and our risk return trade-off improved. Our expected return went from 12.5 to 13.61, and at the same time, we were able to reduce our standard deviation from 12.51 to 10.44. So now what we want to do is calculate the percentage of our investors' portfolio that we would want to put in that risky portfolio with these weights. So like I mentioned before, Bank of America not that hadn't had the greatest history over the last three five years. And yet it still is beneficial to add the um, add the stock based on its history into our portfolio because it provides some diversification. So our calculation for Y asterisk, if we go back here, is equal to the expected return for the portfolio minus the risk-free rate divided by our level of risk aversion for our investor multiplied by the variance of the portfolio. That's what I'm going to put in here. Equals open parentheses expected return for the portfolio minus the risk-free rate close parentheses divided by this, our level of risk aversion. So I'm going to put in open parentheses, select the level of risk aversion, multiplied by the standard deviation. And because we want the variance, we're going to square that standard deviation by uh, pressing shift and the number six to give us the up caret, and then pressing two closing the parentheses, and our percentage for this investor that we would want to put in this portfolio 
is 97% of their investable wealth. And then we'd take 3% and we'd put it in the risk-free asset. What you can see here is that if we increase the level of risk aversion, let's say to 15, that amount in the risky portfolio goes down because they want to avoid more risk. Um, they don't like risk as much. They have to discount that risk more or discount the return more based on that level of risk. As we decrease the level of risk aversion, so someone who might want to seek out more risk, put an eight here, so I lowered that from 10 to eight, we see that if we could, we would put 120%, 22% of their investable wealth into the risky portfolio that we have here. Go back to 10. Let's see what happens when the risk-free rate changes. Because the investor has to make the choice, do I put my money in this risk-free asset so with, with little or no risk of default, so I know I'm going to get that return that I expect, versus the risky portfolio here. So if I increase the risk-free rate to 5%, well, suddenly, at the same level of risk aversion, I want to put less in my risk risky portfolio. I only want to put 79% and more in this risk-free asset because the return's better um, than it was before here. If I decrease this, so we are at 3%, say I put it at 1%, well, suddenly I don't want to put anything in the risk-free asset for this investor because we would put, want to put more than 100% if we could in the risky portfolio. So I hope this video was helpful in explaining how to calculate the optimal risky portfolio using the Markowitz model and then determining what proportion of the investor's wealth we would want to put in to that risky portfolio based on the risk-free rate and the level of risk aversion for our investor.